Good storytelling requires irony, be it for comedic effect or to increase suspense in a scene. It can be implemented in dialogue, a particular situation, or in a character. Ironic characters are usually thought of as our tragic hero, someone who overlooks a weakness or scenario which results in their downfall. But villains can also be ironic by means of functioning as a character mirror. In Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained, Calvin Candy serves as that mirror. Unlike the Brittle Brothers, Big Daddy, or Steven, Calvin possesses dark qualities which our heroes also possess, making him both a more compelling villain and formidable opponent. Today, we will be reviewing five qualities of Calvin Candy which make him a great story villain, and two bonus qualities which make him wickedly entertaining. Quality number one, vanity. Before his introduction, we are told by Calvin's lawyer that Mr. Candy prefers to be called Monsieur Candy, but the man does not actually speak French. Additionally, this fact is not something Django or Dr. Schultz should bring attention to because it will embarrass Monsieur Candy. Vanity is not in and of itself an inherently scary or evil quality, but it adds a layer to our villain letting us know how highly he thinks of himself before seeing how highly he thinks of himself. This superiority complex is evident in all of Candy's appearances, be it in his clothing, his speech, his mannerisms, or his taste in entertainment. Candy views himself above others, and it is this quality which makes him calm yet volatile. It is also Candy's vanity that feeds into one of his bonus qualities, what makes him funny, frustrating, and agitating to watch. Because, as a viewer, we see the irony in his character, but more on that later. Quality number two, callousness. Some of the scenes in Django can leave an audience mentally scarred. I still close my eyes during parts of the movie because of how gruesome they are. But for Candy, it's just another day at the plantation. In both the slave fight and feeding of D'Artagnan to his dogs, Candy is blasé about both events, while in other instances, he is childishly excited about the horror of the situations. He revels in being in control, despite the heartless degree of brutality. Our first time seeing Candy, he is casually watching two men fight to the death describing it as good fun. While we as audience members fidget uncontrollably in our seats, or have our eyes clenched shut, Calvin couldn't be any happier. He is in his element. He is in control. A position which, given his vanity, Calvin more than believes he deserves. Quality number three, greed. A cynic is an individual who knows the price of everything, but not the value. For Candy, everything in his life revolves around money. Schultz and Django only matter to Calvin after they offer him $12,000. D'Artagnan isn't even worth pity or mercy because he hasn't earned Calvin back his $500. Candy, in many ways, is a caricature of the world's most heartless businessman, while simultaneously being believably cold. When Calvin gives Big Fred a beer, he tells him he did a good job, and that he earned it as if it were a pay bonus. When they find D'Artagnan up in a tree, Candy orders him to come down, stating that he is trying to run a business. Everything comes down to Candy's bottom line, if you can offer him thousands of dollars, you are worth something in his eyes. If you owe him a penny, you are indebted to him with your life. The horrific part is seeing this thought process on display, and how Calvin's greed either tempers his cruelty or unleashes it. Quality number four, calculating. After watching a man get murdered with a hammer, Calvin pardons Django's comment of, 
Calvin also pardons Django when he pulls Hoot down from his horse and breaks his collarbone. The reason he allows these transgressions to slide is because he believes $12,000 is on the line. Django, while inferior, is still of value. However, Candy does not hesitate to make an example of D'Artagnan when Django interferes with his, quote, business. In every interaction, Calvin decides what is and what is not acceptable, making it very clear to the audience that he is in control and that our heroes are only allowed in Candyland because Monsieur Candy allows it. This heightened suspense for the entirety of Calvin's presence because we realize that, if at any moment Django and Schultz are discovered, they will be treated no differently than D'Artagnan. Quality number five, implementing concepts in pseudoscience. The same way that a writer might implement an analogy or allegory to characterize someone in their story, the use of a lesson or implementation of a theory functions in a similar fashion. When any character explains their perspective using an analogy or allegory, we as audience members get a better understanding of how they think, while also getting the opportunity to imagine some gray areas in the character's, well, character. Similarly, if a character rationalizes or justifies their actions using science, pseudoscience, or metaphysics, we are told a considerable amount about what a character believes and how they think. For Calvin, the example is phrenology, the study that the shape of a person or people's skull is indicative of their nature, or, in Calvin's interpretation, worth. What this shows the audience is how Calvin thinks. It shows us that he not only views himself as superior, but views other races as inferior. And if one were so inclined, an individual could pause the movie, look up what phrenology is, learn about it, and simultaneously learn a whole other layer to Calvin Candy that couldn't be fit into the movie. This is a phenomenal method to give an audience a boatload of information about a character with creativity and concurrently a minimal amount of time and effort. This same concept can be applied to Calvin Candy's story of Old Ben. While not an allegory, the story of Old Ben's existence taught the young Calvin a lesson which formed him into the monster we see currently. Calvin genuinely believes his slaves are lesser than him biologically because he watched and wondered for 50 years why old Ben never murdered his father. For all you writers out there, keep in mind that stories within a story can be effective tools for characterization and progressing a central story in an entertaining fashion. Bonus quality number one, a dark mirror. A lot of the times, when writing villains, you want them to do more than simply obstruct your protagonist's progress. It can be done. For example, Mike Myers and Freddy Krueger are iconic villains, but they don't serve much function beyond getting in the way of our heroes. Calvin is undeniably a bad person, but if we really stop to look at him, we recognize he has a few things in common with one of our heroes. No, not Django. Dr. Schultz. Something that I didn't realize my first time watching Django is that Candy is, in some ways, Dr. Schultz's opposite, while in other ways, his mirror. Monsieur Candy is not French and cannot speak French. He is a self-proclaimed businessman, but is really a gambler riding off his heritage. A man's life is only worth what Calvin can profit from it, in fact, Calvin does not value life, but is in the business of taking them. Compare that to Dr. Schultz, who is German, and actually speaks German, is a real doctor who does not care to watch people suffer, but also is in the business of taking lives as a bounty hunter. Let's also not forget that, at Story's onset, Schultz is more than willing to use Django to find the Brittle Brothers. It's a kinder form of slavery 
but it's slavery nonetheless. Why I care about this quality as a storyteller has to do with effectively raising moral questions in your work. Both men kill for a living. Why is it acceptable when Schultz does it, but not Candy? Why am I traumatized by the brutal scenes where Calvin kills his slave, but I chuckle when Schultz mows down an entire group of train robbers? By having Calvin serve as a dark mirror to our story's hero, members of an audience have another layer of story to contemplate. When, why, and how do we justify killing? This mirroring also adds richness to the final interaction between King Schultz and Calvin Candy, because we as audience members see Dr. Schultz embarrass Calvin using the man's own ignorance, attacking Calvin's self-image, and, as mentioned earlier, threatening Candy's vanity. Bonus quality number two, blissful ignorance. Intentionally or unintentionally, I love that the racist plantation owner goes to great lengths to hide his ignorance on a subject. In many fields, it is obvious even to Candy himself that he is ignorant of language and literature, but the man is genuinely oblivious to his misguided ideas on race because it feeds into his conception of his own vanity. Again, Monsieur Candy cannot speak French. He does not know what panache means. He needs the help of his black house slave to point out that he is being duped, despite seeing blacks as intellectually inferior. He doesn't know that his slave, D'Artagnan, is named after Alexander Dumas' character from The Three Musketeers, nor does he know that Dumas himself was black. These are all genius shortcomings for a man who thinks so highly of himself, because they are artfully ironic. And this is something that you should apply to all of your characters, ladies and gentlemen, because it is smart, funny, frustrating, and stimulating. More importantly, and what I appreciate most about these ironic shortcomings, is the intelligence with which they are delivered. Yes, villains are obstacles. No, they don't need to be super complex. But, villains are a marvelous opportunity to have fun with your story and explore ideas, flawed or otherwise. When you have a character like Calvin Candy, there is every reason to hate him. But when you put him alongside Dr. Schultz, it forces an audience to ask specifically why they hate him. Mirror villains have this deeper function within storytelling beyond slowing a hero down. They cause a hero to question their morals, force a hero to compromise their beliefs, and sometimes, when done very well, cause the audience to question themselves. <laughs>